We got to go fast because Jimbo's coming up here momentarily. This is uh, Tech Sags Rewind. Thank you so much for watching. Brought to you by T-Mobile. On the show today, we had uh, Ryan Fowler. You got to listen to that interview. He's an Alabama insider. He came at A&M. We came right back at him. Listen to that one. We had uh, Josh Pate, big fan of the show, big friend of the show uh, from Lake Kick. We had Zach Blackerby, who talks Auburn football. They were on the podium today. We talked to him. Roman Harper was there. It was great stuff. How about T-Bob on the show? So much on the program is Tech Sags Rewind. Brought to you by T-Mobile. Visit T-Mobile. I'm talking so fast. Visit T-Mobile dot com slash across America to learn how you can get more value and coverage through T-Mobile. So from your perspective, do you understand, because I feel like it depends on what chair you sit in, the coach's perspective. From your chair, do you understand why Jimbo was ticked off? Well, I, I think he probably should have gave himself another hour. I think you guys got the email according to what I've been told, uh, the press release, 923 and a 10 o'clock press conference. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. So that tells me, and I think my, if he even stalked with Greg Sankey, I thought that maybe that would calm things down if you kind of learn some back channel things about it. I understand why he reacted. Um, I, I get it. It's the same thing that when he reacted to uh, Lane Kiffin, right? I mean, it was not the same day, but I think he called him a clown, and yep. uh, that was National Signing Day. Uh, you, you lead into and, – and Jimbo's one of those guys, you don't have to ask him what he's thinking. He's already told you, right? Yeah. And he's, I mean, so you, you kind of – I'm sure you like to cover a guy like that. You don't have to dig too much. And, and I, I'd like to – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be excited to hear what he has to say today. Is, is there a different tone or is that same energy that he showed uh, even in Sandestin? Um, I, the, well, there was a different tone even then. Well, no, there was. There was. I mean, he had probably had a little bit more time to calm down a little bit. Well, um, I think. And, and he had – thank you there. But, but the problem is, is here. Here's what it is. You got two guys. Oh, and if I didn't give a darn about you – and, and you said something bad about me, it's like, no big deal, no big deal. But what it was, these were buddies. Yeah. These were buddies. These guys were tight. And, and when something is said about between those guys, I think that's what probably hurt them the most because it's a, it was a tight-knit relationship. I've heard Jim Nick Saban talk about Jimbo Fisher is his favorite offensive coordinator. And right there in a press conference. So I think there was a great relationship there. But isn't uh, that why he was upset, though? Because there's a code. The Nick passed. He went through, like, there's a bro code. We all understand sure. the code. Absolutely. And, and even if Nick had his reasons for it, in the re- you, you brought up how impulsive or the quick reaction from Jimbo. To me, it wasn't impulsive because we've been hearing those same comments since November. And by the time the summer came, he had had it. I think Ryan was right to a certain degree, though, because it was laughed off when it was sliced bread. Right. It was irritating when it was Lane Kiffin. And then it was hurtful when it's your buddy. When it was when it's, when it's your friend Saban. Yeah. yeah. And so when you look at that relationship, the the problem. And listen, everybody has a bad moment. I've covered Nick Saban for 15 years. I can I can go ahead and write the quote for Utah State's team the week of. He's as programmed as anybody. Tremendous amount of respect. The guys that transcribe his press conference. I mean, they may have that tremendous respect on like a word, like a code, like a F1 button because they can put it in. He always respects the opponent, always respects the opponent. And for that four or five minutes, he let his guard down. Yep. And that's something that I, I add to the value, and, and this is probably something that your, your listeners are not going to like, but what was it that brought him out? Like, I've covered him since he got off the plane. I've never seen him talk negative about a team. Even when, you know, you got teams out here doing this and doing that and, and probably has a little bit of a reason to be upset. He's always said, no, it, 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 tremendous amount of respect. We, we respect our opponents. They, they played great. Uh, hey, man, they got some awesome teams over there. They got a great football player. They got this. They got this. That guy playing in the NFL. Just all kind of things. And then for this one moment, he went negative. Josh, how does the narrative change, though, if they do get invited to the college football playoffs in 2020, where I think they deserve to be in there, and the way they look at this offense and what he has built? Because 9-1 and one at an all-SEC schedule, people still – Miss that because they look at last year at eight and four and made some of the nine win seasons. Yeah, they would. Um, well, how many people question Georgia right now? You know, Georgia offensively last year in some ways was what A and M was. The statistics look better, right? But the identity was the same. The identity was we're going to lean on those guys on the other side of the ball. Uh, we're going to do enough offensively, but they won a championship uh, because they were in the college football playoff and then did what SEC teams do when they get there, and so. Uh, the answer to your question is, well, they wouldn't be questioned nearly to the degree that they are right now. But that's kind of that bottom line business. Everyone loves to say it's about winning championships, which it is. But it's not, 
it's not like a rich or poor thing, right? You know, sometimes bounces of balls, Bob plays, as I call them, are, are the difference in winning a championship and being a 10 and two team that gets invited to a nice bowl game. But the reality is the way that ball bounces, if it's often upright out versus often upright in, which is sometimes the way those games are decided to, that doesn't change whether what you're doing is right or not. Right. And, and it's not a zero sum. Okay, well, if you get this result, then it's, it's totally thumbs up. If you get this result, it's totally thumbs down. The way it works is kind of, there's this huge vacuum and you've got people looking at tier one teams and then you've got everything else. And the reality is there's, there's tier one teams, but then there's this group of about five or six, A&M's in there, uh, Notre Dame's been in there in the last few years. Oklahoma's in there of teams that are kind of on the precipice, kind of on the yep. brink and the roster and talent level is going to have them there every year which is all you can ask for. You can ask for more, but it's reasonable to say if you're in that tier two and you're bordering on that tier one, especially if you're recruiting like they're recruiting right now, right. You're, you're going to eventually lean on that wall enough to where it falls down, you get in there. So how far is that gap this year from tier one to tier two if tier one is Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia? Good quarterback play. No. Uh, well, I, I, it's not good quarterback play. You need to have A minus quarterback play probably. Uh, B plus to A minus quarterback play to get there. Now to win a championship, it's going to take more than just B plus quarterback play. But, you know, Texas A&M, you know as well as I do, playing in the division they play in, you don't have to win the division to make the playoff. Yep. So if they're in a situation where, and they're a really solid team, even if they were to go to Tuscaloosa, and let's say they're dropping him 31 to 24 or something like that, if you've got, uh, whether it be Haynes or Max, if you've got a guy that's pulling the trigger at quarterback and you're playing at a high enough level and just utilizing your talent roster as well as you can, man, they could be in a situation where they're, they're 10 and 1, 11 and 1 at the end of the year and they're in there anyway. And see, the thing about AM, or at least I feel this way now, you can tell me if you feel otherwise, because of the inevitable infusion of that freshman class that we'll see over the course of the year, it could be a team where the best shot to get them is early. Not only because of the quarterback, uh, quote unquote, uncertainty, and that just means a decision hadn't been made, not only because of that, but because those young guys, obviously, by the time November rolls around, you've got an entire freshman year. Sure. Some of them will have started all year. Some of them will have come in week four or week five. Uh, but that A&M team, I think a lot of folks understand this in the SEC, if you let them hang around and if they're still there, if that LSU game means something consequential to the SEC championship race or the playoff race, they'd be a really, really dangerous team. What does he have to do to keep his job? Is it nine wins? Is it at least nine? Is it? Is I, I, I think it's lower than that. I, I would say seven. I think. Really? I think seven and five, um, and, and maybe you beat a team you're not supposed to, um, which a lot of people say Auburn's not supposed to beat Arkansas. A lot of people say Auburn's not supposed to beat. You know, can, can they beat a Texas A&M at, at home? Um, so, something like that. So, I, I think seven and five, if they look the part, I think will be enough. Yeah, that's. So do you ever think about what it would have looked like had they finished the deal versus Bama, how different the offseason would have felt and the excitement heading into this year, kind of like what A&M went through? And it's not even just the Iron Bowl. If you beat Penn State, I mean, you're down to like the two-yard line and you call a weird play and it was poorly executed. South Carolina, after Bo Nix gets hurt, and it's like if T.J. Finley can offer just somewhat of a semblance of what an SEC starting quarterback should look like, you win that game. Yep. If you don't blow a 28-3 lead against Mississippi State, and then obviously the Iron Bowl is the big one. You know, can tanks stay in bounds? Can, you know, you run the ball just a little bit more to kill the clock quicker and shorten that game a bit? There's, there's so many factors where you look at it. It's like, man, this team was really close yeah. uh, a ton. Um, it, just, it just didn't happen. So you were going to have me on your show to talk about Zach, and I'm going to ask you what you're hearing about Zach and how he's fitting in and – what his chances are of potentially being that starting quarterback? Uh, his chances, I think, are pretty close to 100. Really? Uh, okay. I, yeah, yeah. It, it seems like he's won over the team. I think he's won over the vast majority of the fan base. It seems like everybody that I've talked to, he's putting in the most work of all the quarterbacks. And, you know, Auburn's added a few transfer wide receivers this offseason, and he's the first one to work out with them every single day. And he's not calling and asking. He's saying, hey, we're going to throw. Let's get out there. I don't know if you're really getting that from the other quarterbacks, and obviously that's what you want in the leader and what you want in a starter. So, um, you know, his quarterback coach is posting a lot of videos of him throwing yeah. and, and working out, which, of course, fan bases love that in June and July. So I, I, I think he's won a lot of these folks over. I think he's won his team over. And, you know, I, I think the other guy that he's really competing with is technically a three-man race with Robbie Ashford, who transferred in from Oregon, yeah. and then T.J. Finley, you know, the former LSU quarterback. 
it, it to me it seems like a two man race, and then Robbie Ashford's going to be the backup. That's just kind of what it feels like. But man, I, I just don't see T.J. Finley starting at Auburn. I, I think something bad would have to happen, whether you know Calzada gets injured um, or. He goes out there and just Brian Harson has to do something to, you know, save the program if Calzada underperforms. But, yeah, I, I think it's Zach's job to lose. All right, let's talk a little defense for a moment, safety-wise. Antonio Johnson, what have you seen on film that, that you like? Well, he's uh, versatile. He's played other positions. He's played nickel. He's fast, and, you know, he's played a lot of ball. At the end of the day, I want to see this new, this new scheme of Texas a and It's going to be something I'm not used to seeing. I want to try and jump in and do a little bit more film study as we get more and more game tape in front of us and just really try and see it. But when it comes to talent, the talent's not the question. Mm -hmm. It's never going to be the question with some of these SEC teams, especially with A&M and what they've been doing the last couple of years. So I just – and I love watching – defensive guys fly around, especially right. secondary play. Le uh, Leon O'Neal last year was another guy that I really like to feature and see him make some plays. And, um, and this defense will continue to improve. But I just want to see what they look like under the new regime. Now, I know your answer to this, but I, I don't know if my audience does. Who's the best player in the country? Oh, Will Anderson Jr. Uh. I mean, everybody <laughs> knows that. He's a one-man wrecking crew. And if you don't know who he is, he's number 31 for Alabama. He's a man-child. And he's been that for a couple years yeah. now, but you know, as it continues to grow out, I have to find a new, another favorite player. So do me a favor. If you get a chance, go on the film and watch how he played against Texas A&M. Because I think Ruben Father, he got him a couple times. He did. He did. Look, I mean, it's probably one of the few games. I mean, if he only had like one You're or right. two tackles for loss, he's like, oh, that's a good game. Yeah. Where, where we defended him or tried to block him. And, you know, when you got guys like that, special players, you know, sometimes if they don't make the most special plays, at the end of the night, you give Texas A&M credit. They came down, they made the interception in the end zone to really flip the field when, when Alabama was getting some, uh, mm -hmm. some, some, some momentum. Then when Alabama scored and you thought, oh, here he comes again. Alabama's just going to go. They're going to run away with him here. It takes a &M. Anaya Smith returns that kickoff return for a touchdown. You just, you just can't. Those are the things that happen when it's your night. And it was Texas A&M's night. They made a big field goal to kind of clinch it and seal it. It was a great win. You give them – that is what I love about college football. Yeah. The emotions, you know, you're at home field. And all those things matter so much more to these young men and women that are playing this game. So it's been really cool to just kind of take it all in. I've still yet to be to Kyle Field. Um, but hopefully we get to go this year and I get to be a part of it. All right, so last thing for you. Bama one, Georgia two, let's say. Who's three? In the SEC. Yeah. For me – if Texas A&M does what they're supposed to, they're going to be right there with it. Okay. And if not, I like Tennessee right now. Just because you return Hendon Hooker, yep. the offensive explosion that Josh Heupel is going to bring to this Tennessee team, you still return wide receivers like Tillman. And they just have to be a little bit better defensively. If they're effective defensively, and I'm not saying you got to be good, I just need you to force some turnovers, get some key third down stops. Your offense will carry you the rest of the way, especially with Hendon Hooker going into his second year in this type of offense. And Tennessee's doing a great job of recruiting, just like everybody else is in the SEC. But I really like Tennessee as well. They're, they're my they're third team if Texas A&M, unless Texas A&M steps up and does what they can do, What which I thought they were going to be that team last year. Sure, yeah, yeah. So because of last year, I'm going to take Tennessee, All which right. Tennessee was a sleeper. But I love what Texas A&M is doing. I, can, I expect them to be that team very soon. So it's going to be on them to continue to uh, – not let me down, but continue to answer the bell when I'm talking about them and expectations. All right, guys, I hope I make it to the show tomorrow uh, because there's a lot of bad weather in Atlanta. So do me the favor. This could help the weather situation. Like, comment, subscribe. Like, comment, subscribe. It's Tech Sacks Rewind. Hopefully we'll see you from College Station tomorrow.